beyond being a national master and all of those things, um, I'm also an area boy. <laughs> and that's why I'm wearing this cap. I mean, the fashion police would probably be very triggered right now. So I arrest that guy after this TED talk. Uh, why is he wearing a fila, you know, on a suit? Um, yeah. Also an area boy. And uh, I mean, for the longest time, the term area boy, you know, has always been a derogatory term that is being used to refer to thugs, hoodlums, you know, criminals, in Lagos anyway. But uh, we were able to redefine what that meant. And a lot of us became area boys for the sake of some people. And I'll tell you that story. So, um, some 16 years ago, um, I was at home. I had just completed my primary school education. And uh, my mom called me and told me that I would have to stop school because they just couldn't afford tuition anymore. And I had to stay at home so my brother could go to school. And that was going to be the end of education for me. I wasn't a very brilliant kid in primary school. I mean, I couldn't even speak English at the end of my primary school because the primary school I went to was a Paco school where they taught us in Yoruba and uh, we had to sit on the floor and all of that. So, I mean, I didn't care anyways. I was struggling in school and my teachers would call me Olodo. So, <laughs> so yeah, it was, uh, it was the easy way out. Okay, so no school. So I dropped out of school and I was at home for two years after my primary school education. I was learning how to fix fridge, you know, as an apprentice. Then something happened. There was this barber salon just on the other side of our street. And I would go there to play video games, you know, at the end of the day. Then on one of those days, the barber just brought out a small plastic chess set. And I'd never seen a chess board before. I was a very curious kid. So I asked, oh, what is this? And he said, oh, this is a chess set. And I'd never seen one before, but I was fascinated by the way the pieces were carved. So I told him to teach me because I wanted to learn how to play. Because I would see him just sit down. He was talking to himself. All right? And he would say crazy stuff like, oh, if you play this game, you'll be very intelligent, you'll be very smart. And I told him to please teach me. And he said, no, I was too young. And um, he didn't teach me, so I would just watch him play and his friends. And with time, because I was a very curious kid, I was able to pick up the rules of the game, and I learned how to play chess by watching. At the time, it didn't occur to me that I had made the most important decision of my life. But then, it became clearer with time. Something happened and I got back into school. My mom had to make a sacrifice for me, and I, I got back to school. Unfortunately, the secondary school I attended, they had chess as a subject. I'd never seen that before. We actually learned chess as a subject. And we wrote exams, because I think the owner of the school then was the United Nations ambassador to Kenya, and he played competitively when he was younger. And that was how I found the gift of chess. And I kept playing, I kept playing, and I got really good. And my coach discovered that I was a really gifted child. I remember my teachers had called me a little in primary school. So my, my coach told me I was gifted, and I believed it. And that was the first thing that I learned. You know, as a kid that grew up in poverty in the slums of Ikorodo in Lagos, I found an identity. And it wasn't just any identity. It was an intellectual identity that I could also be intellectually inclined. And I believed it. And it reflected even on my results. I started doing better in school. You know, and I finished secondary school, I was a senior prefect, you know, I passed my work and jump. And I wanted to be a doctor because in my family, it's either you're a doctor or you're a failure. <laughs> because you needed to save your family from poverty. But that didn't work out, you know, missed cut off mark by one point and yidi yada. My parents didn't know anyone. So that was how I gave up on that dream. But I still went to a college, Yaba, Yaba Tech on a scholarship because I was on the college chess team. You know, and I won a lot of medals, you know. I played professionally at the highest level. I was ranked one of the top players in Nigeria. And uh, I finished school in 2015. 
I won a lot of tournaments. I won the Chevron Chess Challenge, the National Friends of Chess. And I was a really strong player. I wanted to become a grandmaster and, you know, jackpot from this country, but, you know, it didn't work out. So I had to settle. But then I gave up on that dream because it was impossible without funding. And I decided to become an entrepreneur, you know, start teaching chess to private schools, just like I had learned. And uh, I'd never thought before. But in that period where I taught chess to children, you know, it made me realize that chess was an important educational resource. I saw children that struggled, you know, with their self-esteem and everything else. I saw them go from that year to year because they became really good at something. And after some time, I gave up on that too because I was earning just stipends. Then one day, I went back to where I grew up and I saw little children like me smoking weed, you know, they were not going to school. Then it occurred to me that this could have been me very easily, but chess gave me a lifeline. It gave me a way to see the world beyond the confines of my environment. It changed my life. And these children would never get to know what they can truly become because poverty had chosen a path for them. And that was the only script that life had made available to them. And they would never get to know that there's a much larger world out there they would never get to know the possibilities that exist on the internet. And on that day, I had an epiphany, and I made a decision to use the gift that I had, the talent that I had, to give it to them as a gift. That in some universe, they might become champions, and people would look beyond their background or what they look like or their poverty and respect them because of what they had the ability to do. Now, you can see how this is intricately linked to how I had my own intellectual identity, and I thought to also give it to other children like me, so they could have the same identity. So now, I didn't know how chess was going to put food on the table of a poor kid living in the slums, but one thing I knew was that it was going to give them a new identity, and people would respect them, people would regard them because of that identity. It wasn't going to be a question of, oh, you're poor, oh, look at what you're wearing, where are you from? So it's going to be a question of, what do you have the ability to do? Now, this child has gained mastery of chess. That means that if you give that child access to other opportunities, you'll be astounded at what they have the ability to do. So I thought I could use chess to bridge that gap for those children that couldn't go to school. So I took a couple of chess balls and I just kept going back to that community every week. I was even jobless, so I had a lot of time on my hands. And time passed. I thought it was hard because how do you teach a child that has never been to school before that a rook moves vertically and horizontally? So I had to just mix it up with Yoruba, gesticulations, and all of that. And after a few weeks, I could tell you that I'd never seen anyone learn at such a pace before. And these students were learning at an incredible pace. What would take a master a year to learn? They were learning it a month and they were damn good at it. And I took them out for a tournament. And they won. They beat everyone. They beat the other kids from, from, uh, from, the, rich, from the rich schools. <laughs> and I couldn't believe it. And I remember going home that day and I cried because I had seen something that the world had neglected for the longest time. We talk about how Africa has so much potential, but we forget that potential is nothing if it's not realized. And I saw children in these impoverished communities with so much potential, but then no opportunity to show the world what they're made of. And on that day, I made a decision, and I committed to doing this for the rest of my life, to use chess as a framework to give these children a new way to express themselves. And who knows, it could become a gateway to other opportunities for them. And I kept doing that, and the world started paying attention and people would reach out to me, oh, Tunde, oh, I saw those kids that are learning chess, oh, they're really good. Are they in school? I'd like to sponsor their education, you know, up onto university level. So chess, people saw that they were showing great aptitude for chess, started giving them scholarships. So at that point, we just gave it a name, oh, Chess and Slums Africa, we just kept doing it. And, um, you know, four years down the line, we've impacted the lives of over a thousand children. Um, <laughs> <coughs> 
There are a lot of incredible stories that I can't even start talking about. For, for those that follow me on Twitter, I've shared quite a lot of them. I remember maybe this time last year I had a thousand followers, but now I have over 250,000 people that follow the stories of children in slums, showing great capacity for thought. Now, that is my journey of how I learned chess and how I also started using the gift of chess to impact the lives of children. We've sponsored so many children, you know, giving them scholarship support. A lot of them have traveled. You know, a lot of them have gotten international scholarships. Just yesterday, I was at the Spanish embassy, you know, to do complete the visa requirements for two children from one of the war slums. I'll be traveling to Barcelona in December for a tournament. And the stories have inspired people from all over the world. Patrice Evra came down to Nigeria for the first time to come to our academy and learn how to play chess, you know. From children living under a bridge that we had thought that we had empowered, the Canadian Embassy, journalists from all over the world, and all those people have come. And I started winning awards, and a lot of these things just started happening really fast. But then there were three years, three quiet years, when I had faith in this idea that sounded crazy, that nobody understood. Now, the lesson, yeah. A lot of you guys are leaving school. You're going into the real world. It's really hard out there. There's one thing that you must always remember. You must have complete and un unwavering faith in those ideas that you have. You must have the courage to impress the world with who you are, with your gift, with your skill. School has only prepared you for, for solving a problem. It's not the certification to get a job, but no. School has prepared you to solve a problem. Every single thing you've learned has been in preparation for this moment. So it is entirely up to you to take that with courage to impress those things on the world. The people that succeed the most at what they do, they're not the best. I'm not the best chess player in Nigeria, even in Africa or anywhere maybe one of the best. But then, I had the courage to impress my idea that chess could change the world. Just a board game could change the world and change the narrative of children in impoverished situations. So that's the first lesson that I'd like you guys to take with you. And secondly, you know, it takes a lot of effort to do good work, right? And whatever work you're doing as you leave here, is to impact the lives of other people. And how do you truly find that intersection, right? When you connect at the intersection of your own privilege and another person's oppression, you know, you find real opportunities to make change. And that is how you should think about your life and impact as you leave this four walls. You're going into the real world to solve problems for other people so that this privilege that you have, there are millions of children, people that do not have it, so it is entirely up to you to pay it forward. And um, finally, you must remember that it is possible to do great things from a small place. And this is the philosophy I've lived by for the longest time, to know that regardless of where I'm from, where these children come from, all of them can do great things from a small place, right? And um, you know, the work you do is going to fill a large part of your life. So you must love what you do. You must have this delusional passion for it. People will think, oh, you're crazy. What does this mean? How can you do this? You must love what you do. You must pour yourself into it every day. Because what you do is going to feel a large part of your life. And um, every day of your life, you must live it like a miracle, right? Because there are weeks when uh, nothing happens. There are decades when nothing happens. But then, there are weeks when decades happen, and someday the spotlight will shine on you. People will call it, ah, you don't blow. No, <laughs> the spotlight will shine on you, and you will get an opportunity you know, to show the world what, you, what you're made of, to prove your mettle, right? And when that moment comes, you must be ready for it. So right now, when nobody's watching, when nobody sees, keep building capacity. Education is not just a certificate that you have. Education is the capacity for thought, for critical thought, for independent thought, for problem solving. And that is the education you have been given, that right now, over 20 million children in Nigeria alone
do not have. So you have been given a gift and you have to pay it forward. And that is the only way to create meaningful impact. And that is the only way that Africa can rise and realize its truest potential. And I'll leave you with this final analogy. You know, in the game of chess, the pawn is the least valuable piece. When you move it down to the final rank, it becomes the most powerful piece, which is the coin. The queen has a value of nine points, but the pawn has a value of just one point. When the pawn undergoes the transformation to become a queen, it becomes powerful. It becomes unstoppable. And this simple analogy reveals the true essence of what I'm doing in my own little space. To help every child consider the pun that the media portrays, you know, the African child in poverty, in tattered clothes, and all of that, that they can truly become powerful, right? And I would not focus on telling the stories that demean them or talk about their poverty, but I would instead build this and shine spotlight on the potential that they have because their story is not one of what they have or where they're coming from. Their story is one of becoming. And I want to implore you guys today that whatever you're doing in whatever capacity, join us, join Africa in building our story of becoming. And that is the only way to create meaningful impact. Thank you very much.